Father, we just thank you, Lord, again for this day. Lord, we thank you for this week and all that it represents. Lord, I don't think we can even find words to thank you enough for coming for us. And Lord, we lift up our eyes as you instructed us to do for that soon coming again. You told us when we see all these things to look up. Lord, I don't think there's any ever been a time in our lives where there's been more of these things that should cause us to look up. And so, Lord, I pray that would be our focus this week upon you, upon looking for your coming again. So, Lord, now we just open ourselves, our hearts and our minds to what you have to share with us this morning, Lord. And, Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, for the privilege of my brothers and sisters here this morning for this church that I get to serve in and Lord, I sit in amazement that you would call me at all. We give you all honor and glory this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So here it is, Christmas week. And I served under a pastor once that for some reason every year, no matter what the holiday, wherever he was teaching in the scripture, it worked out where he could just teach that and it worked for the holiday. I have yet to have that experience. Um, and sometimes I think, well, we're in this book, let's just keep going. I mean, I know it's Christmas or whatever, but do we really need to stop and do something special. And, and I'll be totally transparent with you as I try to always be. It's a challenge every year to say, okay, Christmas message. How can I say this differently? And how can I make sure it's what the Lord would want us to hear and not what I think we should hear? So I sat down to study this week and I said to myself, self, what are we going to do? And that was the wrong conversation, first of all, because I should have been asked in the Lord. Um, I don't need any answers from myself. Um, but you know, Tuesday night, if you're going to be here, and I'm sure you all will, you're going to hear the Christmas story. And so with two days in between, I'm not going to take us through the classic Christmas story. But you know, it became interesting to me is when I looked on the calendar and I realized that tonight at sundown begins Hanukkah. So I thought, well, that's interesting. And I love to teach on the holidays, especially the feast days. And I've taught on the feast before and I do it periodically because I need us to see from the scripture that that's God's calendar. Everything God does is on a feast day. Everything that's monumental prophetically happens on a feast day. Really, the two clocks that God has is Israel and the feast days, and those two really are, kind of go hand in hand. And so you come to this holiday, Hanukkah. And, and if you didn't grow up Jewish, then it's just something that Jews do. And I remember as a Jewish child, my friends thought it was just the Jewish Christmas. You know, it's what we did instead of what they did. Now, in my household, my, I, I was a little bit spoiled. My wife might say a lot. But, um, but we didn't have Christmas. But my mom felt bad for me and my brother because all our friends were getting Christmas. And so we had Santa Claus. And so I woke up on Christmas morning to presents, no tree, but just Santa Claus had came. Because Santa Claus loved Jewish kids too. And, um, but then I also got Hanukkah. And so December was usually pretty good for me. But this, this holiday of Hanukkah, it seems insignificant. As a matter of fact, most Jews know more about Hanukkah than they know anything about the feast days. And yet, it's there for a reason. And you'd be surprised if you don't know what the tie-in between Hanukkah and Christmas, Hanukkah and Jesus is. And so I thought I'd take us through what led to Hanukkah. And what's interesting about Hanukkah is it's not counted amongst the feast days, the seven major feasts, although it's considered a feast. And we'll talk about that as we go through this presentation. But you know what's interesting? Of all the feasts, there's nothing about this feast in the Old Testament. There's no history of how we even got to what is called Hanukkah in the Old Testament. And yet it's a Jewish feast day. Matter of fact, the only place in Scripture where we see Hanukkah being celebrated is the New Testament. And it's not there just by any of the authors. It's actually there 
aligned with a story about Jesus himself. I don't know if you knew that Hanukkah was in the New Testament. But it's not in the Old. And so where's the story told? Where do we even get that? I had to ask that question for myself. I grew up with the holiday. I grew up knowing about it, celebrating it. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll let you know a little bit about my past. Um, I think God had a plan for me, and that's almost silly to say, from the beginning that I might be a teacher. Now, I mean, I taught for 20 years in the military. I was an instructor. I, I came out into the corporate world and became a trainer. Seems like it's followed me. But when I was a child, I don't even remember. I need to ask my mom. I'll probably call her tomorrow. I don't remember how it happened, but I, I remember being this little kid, and yeah, I was once littler than this. And, um, and I was taken before the different classes. I mean, I was like third grade. And I would stand up there with my little Hanukkah menorah, and I'd tell the story. I don't know how that ever happened. But I, I, would, I would be the kid that went around and told the Hanukkah story in a public school. Those days aren't here anymore. And so I put this together because I didn't know how else to tell you the story. It's too much information. I could have wrote it as a story and read it to you and watched you sleep. I could, have, I could have tried to memorize it and impress you, but I don't need to do that. So I put it in slides so you could read along with me because it is kind of a story. And I hope you liked history in school because this is quite a history lesson. And I would be surprised if many of you know this story, truthfully. You may have heard of some of the characters. You may have known some of the, the, the geopolitical players in the story. But I have to be honest, even as someone who grew up celebrating this, I didn't really know this whole history. And I've told you many times that I've been on this journey for a couple years of going, why do I believe what I believe? And in this wasn't one of the places I thought I'd discover something different than I thought I knew. And so we're going to go through this today in the time we have remaining. Um, so where does this all begin? Well, we've got to kind of look at where it begins if technology is going to help. Hanukkah. There's something called the intertestamental period. You may have heard of that before. It's also called the 400 silent years. And it's that missing time between the Old and the New Testaments, in case you didn't know there was missing time there. It's the mysterious time between the final book of the Old Testament, Testament Malachi, and when we see John the Baptist come on the scene in the first of the Gospels, Matthew. The intertestamental period. And there were no prophets, no visions, no angelic visits during that time frame, not, at least not recorded. So the question is, had God forgotten his people or stopped working? No. Many important events occurred in Israel during those 400 years. There was the development of the synagogues, the rise of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the de um, domination by Rome over the nation of Israel. And additionally, very importantly, the Romans built the road system and Greek became the common language of the known world. Two extremely important things for the gospel to be spread roads to walk on in a common language by which it would be spoken. During those four centuries, events took place that led to the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is the Hebrew word for dedication. The holiday is so named because it celebrates the rededication of the temple to the Lord after it was desecrated by the Gentiles. This is the story of the epic struggle and exploits of one of the greatest Jewish victories of all time independence from Greco-Syrian oppression in 165 BC. Isn't it interesting in the Christmas songs that we sing, these hymns that we sing that are so beautiful, so theologically sound, how really timely they are. The world they describe is the world we live in today, not a land of old. And there's still that hope within these Christmas carols. And this is what drew me in, because again, public school, we were actually singing Christmas carols when I was a kid. And I didn't get those at home, so I used to be fascinated by them, go home singing them. And it was really interesting to me that supposedly that was the other group's religion, but yet they were singing about the Jews. There was all this stuff about Jesus and the Jews, and I never got it as a kid. No one told me, because Jesus was theirs. Moses was ours. But that hope for them to someday see the glory of God again to be the light to the world. That's the hope that still remains. 
It's what the whole of Scripture really is about. The Gentiles got grafted into something amazing. It's also called the Feast of Dedication because, as I said, Hanukkah means that. And we'll see another name for it as we go through this. Today, Hanukkah is an eight-day feast or holiday celebrated beginning with the 25th day of Kislev, which is the ninth Hebrew month. Remember, there's a Hebrew calendar. There's a Hebrew calendar, and then we have a Gregorian calendar. And that's why every year these Jewish feasts fall on different days on our calendar because it's on the Hebrew calendar. And so this year just is interesting. The eight days flow right with Christmas. They overlap pretty often, not always. Even though the history of Hanukkah is not recorded in Scripture, it is the most historically documented of all Jewish holidays. The earliest historical record of Hanukkah is found in the books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Don't look in your Bible for those. These books are among the 14 books of the Old Testament Apocrypha. And if you've been raised to think Apocrypha is a dirty word, I'm sorry. Apocrypha is a collection of non-inspired Jewish writings written between 200 B.C. and 100 A.D. They're non-inspired, which means they weren't included in the canon of Scripture because they were believed to have not been inspired by God, although, as I've written here, they're very valuable historical records. So we're going to go through this history. But it's not just a history, it's also a prophecy. Because I said, the holiday of Hanukkah is not in the Old Testament, but prophetically, it's spoken of. And when we get to that, and if you've never seen it, you're going to be blown away. Not blown away because you're surprised God would put something in prophetically in the Old Testament, but it's once again someplace where I hope your jaw drops if you've never seen it, and you get excited about the Word of God. 336 B.C., turbulent times. Darius III comes to the throne of the mighty Medo-Persian Medo Empire. Now some things I'm going to read, some things I just hope you catch, like all the scripture references, they're in there in parentheses, but I'm not going to read each one. But here's a map of what that Medo-Persian Empire, you can see that it involved quite a bit of real estate. It surrounded the Mediterranean Sea, most of the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, the Red Sea, the Persian Gulf, all the way into the Indian Ocean. Quite a bit of land. Around the same time, the son of Philip II, king of the Greek city-state Macedonia, ascends to the throne at the young age of 20. His name was Alexander. He was a brilliant commander and a military genius. Alexander moved with lightning speed against the wealth and might of the Persian Empire, which dwarfed his own. In 332 BC, only some three years later, the armies of Alexander the Great defeated Darius III. By age 30, Alexander had conquered all the then known world from Europe to Egypt to the borders of India. And there's his empire, pretty much the same as he took over what was someone else's and added to it a little bit. True to his teacher, Aristotle, Alexander unified his empire through the cohesive force of Greek culture and religion known as Hellenism. The golden age of the Greek empire was extremely brief, lasting only a few short years. Two things I want to point out about that. You see in the New Testament, they talk about the Hellenists. And, and, we, and I want you to know, this is the struggle that they were going through. This is the origin of that struggle, that they were struggling with the Hellenists, the ones that were trying to apply the Greek culture to the Jewish people, snuffing out their beliefs and the true God. And I find it also fascinating, just, just as a sideline, if you've ever traveled parts of the world, it's amazing how much the Greeks actually influenced parts of the world in just a short amount of time. But I won't take us through all that. Then at the age of 33, Alexander the Great died without an heir. The ruler of his empire was passed to his four generals. They geographically divided the immense Grecian empire into four parts. Seleucus ruled over Syria and eastern Asia Minor. Ptolemy ruled over Egypt. Lysicamus ruling Thrace and western Asia Minor, which is today's Turkey. Cassander ruling Macedonia and Greece. During that time, if not for its geographical location, the vassal state of Israel would have likely remained unnoticed. But that was not the case. Israel was strategically located between Syria and Egypt, 
completing the land bridge between the continents of Asia, Africa, and Europe. That's why it's strategically still important today. Control of Israel was key to dominance in the region. With the death of Alexander, Israel again found herself at the center of the maelstrom. For almost two centuries, Israel had been caught between the expansionist Seleucid and Ptolemaic dynasties that sought to dominate the Middle East. 171 BC, Antiochus IV came to the Seleucid throne in Syria. He was a tyrant, cruel, harsh, and savage. He believed that he was a deity in the flesh. He referred to himself as Antiochus Theos Epiphanes, Antiochus the visible, invisible, the visible God, or just Antiochus Epiphanes. Now as I go through these historical facts, hold on to them in your minds. Because later on when you see scripture unfolded, again, I just want you to see that nothing happens without God's hand in the midst of it. Nothing. Antiochus was anxious to unite his kingdom of many languages, cultures, and religions. These diversities fanned the fires of individual nationalism and independence. He desired to Hellenize or impose Greek language, thought, and religion upon his subjects in an effort to unify his rule through assimilation. As a result, two political factions developed within Israel. The religious in Israel comprised the Orthodox party. They desired rule by the Ptolemies in Egypt since that dynasty did not seek to Hellenize its subjects. Now, you all see, so, see some parallels between them and what's going on politically in our own world today. Hellenism was far more than just Greek philosophy and an ordered society. It was built around the Greek religion. It deified nature, created a pantheon of mythological gods. The Orthodox party was committed to preserving Judaism and the pure worship of the God of Israel. Then, on the other hand, there were those of the progressive Hellenist party. They included many of the aristocracy who had little concern for the faith of their fathers. They saw only the economic and social advantages of appearing enlightened, civilized, and accepted by the advanced nations throughout the world which embraced Hellenism. Therefore, these Hellenists desired Syrian rule along with its imposed Greek culture. In Jerusalem, the current high priest was a man named Yohanan. He was fervently opposed to Hellenistic forces within the nation. Yohan had a brother named Joshua. He did not have the same convictions as his brother Yohanan. Joshua changed his name to the Greek name Jason and led the Hellenistic faction. He was actually supported by many in Israel. Jason offered an enormous bribe to Antiochus Epiphanes to obtain the office of high priest. He also promised to build a temple to the Greek god Phallus in Jerusalem and to enroll the people of Jerusalem as citizens of Antioch, the capital of Syria. Antiochus happily gave his consent and Jason became high priest. Jason had his brother killed by assassins and Israel became a cauldron of internal strife. Never before had an outsider dared to tamper with the divinely instituted high priesthood. Then, three years later, Menelaus, a fanatical Hellenist, and not even from the high priestly family, obtained the high priest office by an even larger bribe. He was disappointed to learn the temple treasury could not support the payment of his bribe, so he stole the golden vessels from the temple to pay his bribe to Antiochus. Meanwhile, the ambition of Antiochus Epiphanes continued to grow. He aspired to reunify the Grecian Empire as in the days of Alexander the Great. In 168 BC, he warred against Egypt and victory seemed certain. However, the Roman Senate dispatched Papilius Lanus to prevent Antiochus from taking Egypt. Antiochus was asked if he wished peace or war with Rome. Antiochus stalled for time. The Roman representative drew a circle in the sand around Antiochus and stated that he must decide before leaving the circle. Consequently, Antiochus was forced to withdraw from Egypt in great humiliation. Returning to Syria, Syria Antiochus made a stop in Jerusalem. Already in a rage because of Roman interference, he then learned that Jason had mounted a rebellion against Menelaus 
after hearing a rumor of Antiochus' death. Antiochus was incensed by this mockery and challenge to his authority. The ongoing political intrigue within Israel and deep-seated resistance to Hellenization had run its full course with Antiochus' patience. Without warning, Antiochus ordered his general to destroy Jerusalem. The full weight of his wrath and frustration was vented on the people, on the Jewish people. Houses were burned, the walls of the city were breached, and tens of thousands were killed or sold into slavery. Unsatisfied, Antiochus turned his attention to the temple on Mount Zion. Syrian soldiers hacked and smashed the porches and gates. They stripped the temple of its golden vessels and treasures. On the 50th day of the month of Kislev, 168 BC, Antiochus erected an idol of Zeus, the supreme deity of the Greek pantheon, on the holy altar in the courtyard. Not surprisingly, the idol bore the face of Antiochus himself. Then, on the birthday of Zeus, Antiochus offered a pig on the altar. The pig was the ultimate abomination to the Jewish mind, strictly forbidden by the law of God. Antiochus sprinkled its blood in the Holy of Holies and poured its broth over the scrolls before he cut them to pieces and burned them. Then, excuse me, the nation suffered shock and horror. They reeled with severe trauma. The sanctuary of the Most High had been polluted and profaned. It had been desecrated and defiled. In the words of 1 Maccabees, it was laid waste like a wilderness and trodden down. The nation was left utterly desolate. The temple was converted to a shrine to Zeus and only swine were permitted for sacrifice. A fortress called the Acre was erected adjacent to the temple so that the Syrian garrison could control the shrine. Antiochus issued an edict forbidding the practice of Judaism on pain of death and enforced it by house searches. If Sabbath was observed or dietary, dietary laws were kept or circumcision performed or scrolls of the law found, the whole family was put to death. Babies were hung around their mother's necks and women were thrown from the walls of the city. The line had been drawn. Either assimilate or be annihilated. Dark days followed, filled with terror and persecution. The faithful immediately fled to the wilderness or to the Judean hills to live in caves but they were hunted like animals. During that time of intense suffering, thousands sacrificed their lives to remain true to their God. Jewish history records several such heroic acts of faithful devotion. Eliezer, 90 years of age and one of the principal scribes, was brought before Antiochus and commanded to eat swine's flesh. He refused to defile himself and break the law of God, so the soldiers asked him to bring his own lawful meat and eat as if it were the detestable pork. After an eloquent statement of faith, he remained unmoved, not willing to deceive the young people with his example. With that, the soldiers beat him mercilessly until he died. Another account relates the enduring courage of a woman named Hannah and her seven sons. They too were arrested and compelled to eat swine's flesh and thereby assent to the pagan sacrifice. One by one, the sons were tortured, and when they refused to yield, they were boiled alive in cauldrons. When one of the sons was approached to apostatize or have his tongue and hands cut off, he courageously testified, these I had from heaven, and for his laws I despised them, and from him I hope to receive them again. Another affirmed before he died, it is good being put to death by men to look for hope from God to be raised up again by him. At the as the last son was pressed to deliver himself by apostatizing, his mother encouraged him with words about the resurrection. She said this, but doubtless the creator of the world who formed the generation of man and found out the beginning of all things will also of his own mercy give you breath and life again. Fear not this tormentor, but being worthy of thy brethren, take thy death that I may receive thee again in mercy with thee thy brethren. Finally, the mother was put to death. All steadfastly refused deliverance in hope of the resurrection. What a testimony. The pain of the Jewish nation continued. Syrian detachments were dispatched throughout the nation to enforce the diabolical plan of Antiochus. One detachment came to a tiny village of Modin, about 17 miles northwest of Jerusalem. 
There they built a pagan altar to Zeus. The townspeople were assembled and an aged priest named Mattathias was singled out of the crowd. He was offered, he was ordered to offer a sacrificial pig to the Greek gods in honor of Antiochus. Mattathias was the great grandson of Hasmon, the descendant of Joharib, of the first division of priests. He was also the father of five sons, John, Simon, Judah, Eliezer, and Jonathan. All eyes were on him. What would he do? Never, he replied in defiance. But at that moment, an apostate priest approached the altar and requested permission to offer the pig. The townspeople knew what this would mean, and after the sacrifice, they would be forced to eat its flesh in identification with the offering. Indignation stirred in the heart of Mattathias and erupted into violence. He snatched the sword from the hand of the Syrian officer and killed him. Rushing forward, he ran the sword through the body of the apostate Jew, leaving his body on the altar. At the same time, his five sons engaged and slew the remaining soldiers. They pulled down the altar. Knowing that retribution would follow, they left all possessions and fled to the hills. And so the revolt began an uprising against the enemies of the one true God. Each day the rebellious force grew. They engaged in guerrilla warfare, attacking Syrian outposts, destroying pagan altars and chastising apostate sympathizers. Mattathias became sick and died. He passed the leadership to his son Judah. Wise choice, as Judah was a military genius. He was called the Maccabee, believed to be from the Hebrew word Maccabee, meaning hammer. And the whole, that was the family's last name, Maccabee, but he was known as the hammer. It was the force that went after this invading force. The revolt raged for three years. Hiding in caves and lying in ambush, the Maccabees gradually wore down the Syrian occupation. The freedom fighters were finally able to meet the enemy in open battle. They secured stunning victories and opened the road to Jerusalem. The forces of Judah were not prepared for what they would encounter in Jerusalem. The gates of the temple were burned, weeds grew waist high in its courtyards, and above it all loomed the hideous idol of Zeus. They ripped their clothes and threw handfuls of dust on their heads as they wept. The nation had been made desolate. They immediately began to cleanse the sanctuary. They removed the defilement of the Greek idol. Because of the contamination to the altar, they pulled down its stones and stored them until there should come a prophet to give an answer concerning them. They re rebuilt the altar, and on Kislev 25, 165 B.C., exactly three years to the day of the defilement, they rededicated the altar to the Lord. According to Jewish tradition, the Maccabees found only one small cruse of oil in the temple, which still bore the unbroken seal of the high priest. It was only one day's supply for the golden lampstand. Miraculously, it burned for eight days. Hence, this tradition is one explanation of why Hanukkah is celebrated for eight days. And interestingly, and we shouldn't be surprised, eight days was the exact time it would take to purify additional oil so that they could continue having it burn. For them, the thought of lighting this great candelabra only to see it go out again must have been heart-wrenching. Yet the zeal to rededicate the temple was so strong Despite the dilemma, they decided to light the candelabra. A traditional saying arose from this Hanukkah story. In Hebrew, it's Neskadol Hayasham, which means a great miracle happened there. Now, when they celebrate this holiday in Israel, they say it differently as a great miracle happened here, because that's where it took place. But you know, the celebration of Hanukkah commonly involves the lighting of a candelabra, the menorah, and there's two type of menorahs that you'll see. There's a traditional menorah that you'll see that has seven places for the lights. We use candles now, would have been oil in those days. This would have represented, not exactly, but the, the golden lamp stand that was placed into the tabernacle and then into the temple when it was finally built. We could come up with many reasons. There's seven, it's definitely God's divine number, days of creation. We could go on and on. But that would be the common one that you would see and, and really the traditional one that you would see. And then a Hanukkah menorah, they come in all kinds of shapes, colors, sizes. Some of them are ridiculous today, what they do with them. 
but you'll see that there's nine places for either candles or oil. And the reason for that is because of this holiday, because they were able to light that seven flamed menorah and have it burn for eight days. So the four and the four represent the eight days of that original burning. The one here, which on some menorahs you'll find actually on the end, is what's known in Hebrew as the shamash. The shamash is the light that lights all of the others. It actually just means assistant, helper, and it, it, would, it would be the light. Although I see great representation of that light in the Lord himself, being the one who lights those fires. Um, and they're lit from left to right to go with the direction that the language of Hebrew is read, reversed of our own. And just to throw it in there, one of the other traditions during the, amongst many, during the celebration of Hanukkah in a lot of Jewish families, and you may have seen it before, they have a game they play called dreidel. There's these little tops. And I could give you a bunch of other examples of things that are traditionally part of the holiday, but I bring this one up in particular. Um, anybody ever played this before, dreidel? Basically, it's done with coins or candies, and very often at that time of year, they'll hand out these little um, uh, gold foil-covered chocolates, and, and they're known as gelt, which is just um, Yiddish for money. Um, and basically, it's just a game. They spin this depending upon which side it ends up on. There's four different Hebrew letters. And the game is like if it lands on one letter, you get half the pot. If it lands on another one, you've got to put half of yours in the pot. Or you, another letter, you get them all. Or you give them up all. You know? So it's just one of those typical games. But you may have played this before and not understood why these particular four letters. Well, this saying, Neskadol Hayim Shem, each of the words there, the first Hebrew letter of each of those words is represented in these four. And so that's, that's where those letters come from. So now you're all prepared to celebrate. Even though we have the legend of the oil cruise today, it provides no credible answer as to why Hanukkah is celebrated for eight days. This was a surprise to me. Because I thought that was fact. And then I asked myself, where did we even get that? You know, it's not in the Bible. And that's not recorded in the books of Maccabees either as to that being the reason. It's a good story, but it isn't mentioned in the earlier accounts of the Maccabean revolt, such as 2 Maccabees. The legend of the oil isn't mentioned until much later in another set of Hebrew writings called the Talmud. So where do we find other answers as to why Hanukkah is celebrated for eight days and why it it is celebrated with lights. Well, we need to look no further than Scripture to find the pattern for Hanukkah. In Scripture, an eight-day period was always the pattern of dedication. That is, the object was set aside, sanctified, for seven days, and then on the eighth day, it was holy to the Lord. Such was the case with firstborn animals consecrated to God. Hebrew males were also circumcised on the eighth day, also not a coincidence, because it, it's not until the eighth day in a child's life that the blood is able to coagulate. If you did it any earlier, you'd risk the child bleeding out. So when God set that, he did it in accordance with his own creation and the way it works. The original altar in the temple was sanctified for seven days, and on the eighth day it was holy. The dedication of the temple after the Babylonian captivity took place during Passover, which in conjunction with the Feast of Unleavened Bread lasted for eight days. Further, the future altar of the Millennial Temple will be consecrated on the eighth day. An even closer parallel to Hanukkah was the situation of King Hezekiah's day. His father, the wicked King Ahaz, had des des desecrated the temple of the living God with altars and sacrifices to the Assyrian gods. When godly King Hezekiah supposed to be, came to the throne, he cleansed the temple and rededicated it to the Lord after eight days. But there's even a further reason that Hanukkah is celebrated for eight days. It was directly patterned after the Feast of Tabernacles. From 2 Maccabees, and they kept eight days with gladness, as in the Feast of the Tabernacles, remembering that not long afore they had held the Feast of Tabernacles when they wandered in the mountains and dens like beasts. Therefore they bare branches and fair bows and psalms also. 
and sang psalms unto him that had given them good success in cleansing his place. So originally, Hanukkah was almost a second observance of tabernacles, in much the same way that Hezekiah instituted a second observance of Passover when people were not able to keep it, keep the first one. This explains why the Hallel, which is Psalms 113 through 118, which was originally sung only at tabernacles, is still sung in the synagogues for Hanukkah today. The Maccabees sang psalms in the tabernacles. That's what it tells us there from what we just read. So what about the lights? The fact that Hanukkah is patterned after tabernacles is also provides the meaning for the emphasis on lights. When Solomon dedicated the first temple to the Lord, he did so at the Feast of Tabernacles. That dedication was accompanied by the coming of the Shekinah glory to the temple and the divine lighting of the fire upon the sacrificial altar. As a result, the Feast of Tabernacles later developed an impressive light celebration. Since Hanukkah celebrated the relighting of the fire on the purified altar and was patterned after tabernacles, the emphasis was borrowed quite naturally as well. So it's also known as the Festival of Lights, not just the Feast of Dedication, not just Hanukkah. It's also called the Festival of Lights. The Hebrew Scriptures do not directly mention Hanukkah since the holiday was not instituted until after the Old Testament was complete. But even though Hanukkah is not mentioned by name, the events of Hanukkah were prophesied centuries beforehand by the Hebrew prophet Daniel. I hope this excites you. This was not new to me. But I felt like it was. Because I just, oh, God's word is so good. Daniel saw an awesome vision. Now, I'm not going to take you through the proofs of what I'm going to tell you the vision was about. Just take it on, on account that I know that this is what it's about. But some other time we'll study it in the book of Daniel. But in his awesome vision, he saw a ram with two horns. That's the medio persian Empire. Pushing so hard that no beast could stand before it. Then a goat, which is Greece, appeared in the west and moved so quickly that its feet did not touch the ground. A very noticeable horn, which is always a sign of power, Alexander the Great, was between its eyes. The goat, which was Greece, crashed into the ram, Medo-Persia, with incredible fury and broke the two horns from its head, all but killing it. No sooner had the goat, Greece, become great when its large horn was broken, allowing for four smaller horns, Alexander's generals, to replace it. Then amazingly, a little horn, Antiochus, came up from one of the four and became exceedingly powerful. It cast down some of the stars, the righteous Jews, and stamped on them. To the prince of the starry host took away the sacrifices and cast down his sanctuary and the temple in Jerusalem. And we're back. Several chapters later, Daniel again prophesied of this coming Syrian persecution and the courage of God's people. From Daniel chapter 11, those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many, Yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame, by captivity and plundering. You should be applauding by now. Not me, but the word of God. I mean, there we have it prophesied. And if you're not familiar with the book of Daniel, then hold on when we finally get to that book. Because just about everything is prophesied in the book of Daniel. The exact day that Israel becomes a nation again. Exact day, year, month. So much. And it is Christmas time. 
It's also interesting just to mention about Daniel. Daniel was put over what they called the magicians when he was in captivity in Babylon. And if you follow that whole history out, what you'll find is it's very, very, very likely that the Magi that traveled to meet Jesus at his birth, well, actually they didn't meet him at his birth, it was two years later. That's a Christmas card myth. We're probably trained by Daniel himself. We were able to tell them directly of the prophecy of this coming Messiah and sent on that journey because of what they learned from Daniel. Very interesting. During Hanukkah, which celebrates freedom from foreign oppression, thoughts of national deliverance should again be aroused. In the day of Jesus, Israel was looking for the ultimate deliverer, the Messiah himself who would overthrow Roman rule. If he delivered them, they would never again fall under Gentile dominion. He would usher in the golden messianic age, making it possible for the Shekinah glory to return to the temple as in the days of Solomon's dedication of the temple. With all these scriptures on their minds, a group of Jewish inquirers came to Jesus. It was Hanukkah. And Jesus was walking along Solomon's porch in the temple. Jesus was celebrating Hanukkah in the same temple that had been cleansed and rededicated only a few generations before. Now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. These inquiries, inquirers approached Jesus, and they asked, then the Jew, well it says there in the scripture, then the Jews surround him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus had clearly shown that he was the Messiah and verified it with many miracles. They rejected him because they consistently failed to meet their specific messianic expectations. They were looking for a military Messiah, one who was only a great human leader. Jesus tried to broaden their narrow understanding on the deity of the Messiah by his significant assertion, I and my Father are one. This drove them into such a rage that they sought to stone him. And I love it. It says that he walked through the crowd and they didn't see him. Earlier in the same passage, Jesus claimed to be the good shepherd. There he was identifying with the shepherd of Israel in a similar, albeit less direct claim to deity. But there would be no new occasion of Hanukkah. The overturn of Gentile rule because the nation was still blind in their rejection. When my people rejected Antiochus, God kept his promise miraculously preserving them. But when the Jewish leaders wrongly rejected Jesus' claims that day, they missed an even greater miracle than Israel's against all odds victory over the overwhelming Syrian army. They missed the miracle of Emmanuel, God with us. It's not a misspelling. It can also be spelled with an I. That miracle gave Jesus the right to claim power to preserve those who come to him. Only as God come in the flesh is Jesus, able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. God keeps his promise even when we fail to recognize it. He said, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. For unto us a child is born, unto us a child is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus fulfilled these precious promises from God. In him, God has proven his faithfulness to Israel and to all the world. This month, those of us that have accepted his claims can celebrate the miracle of Hanukkah as well as the miracle of Christ's birth. Because God keeps his promises, he will save and sustain Israel. Because God keeps his promises, he will save and keep all those who call upon his name through faith in Emmanuel, our Messiah, Jesus. Because God keeps his promises, he has made each blood-bought believer to be his own temple, where Emmanuel, God with us, has taken up residence. And so because God keeps his promises, let us join together in dedicating ourselves anew to live for him by the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit who burns within us.
Where Jesus the Christ is exalted, where Jesus the Christ is accepted, where his death, burial, and resurrection are believed, there is light, joy, and hope. The real message of Hanukkah and Christmas is that there is light to those who will receive it. Of the Messiah, it is written, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. During this Hanukkah Christmas season, we would do well to remember that. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. But no matter how dark the night may appear to be, for the child of God, there is a light to light the way. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. You know, the great miracle in both the Christmas and Hanukkah, it's not any really of the physical things so much as it's just the fulfilled promise of God's faithfulness that he would send a Savior. And the connection between these two great stories, these two holidays, these is just, just an amazing one. And it again highlights the amazing ways that God has told us everything we need to know if we know where to look for it. I also want you to see just how much history can be behind one verse. We sometimes can go by things so fast in Scripture that we're not curious. We wouldn't think about the fact that Jesus was walking on the porch of Solomon in the temple during the Feast of Tabernacle. And maybe not even wonder where that came from, the great history, the way God has always worked and will work to preserve his people. Now there's a future setting for this story. And it's very common with God's word is that there will be a prophecy of something to come. There'll be the fulfillment of a coming and yet a future fulfillment if we know where to look. In this case, the future fulfillment of the story we read today comes during the period we know as the tribulation. And in the midst of the tribulation, at that three and a half year mark, the Antichrist who has pulled the wool over all of the world about who he is will proclaim himself God. He will step in to the temple, which is yet to be rebuilt. He will step into the temple he will proclaim himself God. He will raise up an image of himself to be worshipped. And he will again bring what they call desolation, abomination of desolation and make that same horrible sacrifice that we just witnessed so long from so long ago. And so that's the future fulfillment of that. But then the future fulfillment of the rest of the story is that God will preserve the Jewish nation, a remnant of the Jewish nation, through that period. He will help them escape that situation. And all that hope that we sing about in these Christmas carols will be fulfilled. And so we don't just hope with an empty mind and heart, wondering, will it come to pass? The word of God says it will come to pass. As certain as your salvation is when you proclaim that Jesus is God's son, we can also proclaim that those words will be fulfilled as Israel again becomes the light of the world when he saves that remnant his people, someday. Though a little less than traditional Christmas story. I hope you found it interesting. Worship and come back up, ushers. As, as we come to the communion table this morning, It's interesting, in a sense, that we're kind of at the midway of Jesus' story. This week we celebrate the beginning of that story in the sense that he came as a child into human flesh, which should shock us alone. And then we come to that point where he's been crucified, buried, resurrected, and we take that entirety of the story, sort of a midway point, certainly a midway point to history as we know it. What's interesting though, there can't really be a midway point because there's an eternity for the rest of it. And so there's no balance to that actually. But when you come to the table this morning, consider the whole story. I would even ask you to consider the story that you just heard. Because every 
one of you, each of us, has a battle to fight. In every case, in every case, the enemy seeks to kill the life of the Savior in you. Either by trying to keep you from ever finding that Savior, or once you have, making you believe maybe it's not real, or to make your challenges so great that you would think God has turned his back on you. The entirety of the biblical history is the attempt to stop the royal bloodline that began at the beginning, culminated with Jesus himself, and now lives in us as his church. And so when you come to that table, realize that this is where he broke the curse. He broke the curse, and all who believe in the work that he did there, in the shedding of his blood, and the breaking of his body, is released from that curse. We still come under the struggle. We still step in and out of the stain. But we have a freedom there that no other can claim. None other. And so celebrate that this morning. Make it special for yourself this week. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. This time together. for the gift of your salvation, and Lord, as this story showed us, for the gift of your preservation. You preserve us, Lord, through all that we face, as long as we believe on you, as long as we testify of you as Son of God, Savior, Light of the world. And so, Lord, we celebrate that this morning, all that you've done, all that you're doing, all that you've promised to do, and by faith we believe will be fulfilled. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.